Hi, everyone. Um, as Serena mentioned, I'm the Waterbird Program Director at the San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory. And I'm introducing Alicia today because I was lucky enough to have her working on my team. Um, after she graduated from Santa Clara University in environmental science, she was our Waterbird intern in 2019. So my experience with her was that she has extremely strong bird ID skills and she helped my team in identifying over 90 species of water birds and raptors in the uh, South San Francisco Bay in the restoration project. And she also supported us at BBO by writing grant applications for both the water bird team and the land bird program. Uh, she participated in our family science events and she also helped with a lot of our social media campaigns in 2019. Um, since she completed her internship with SFBBO, she is now a coral restoration technician and she is working at the Moat Marine Laboratory's Elizabeth Moore International Center for, for Coral Reef Research and Restoration. Uh, her work right now involves coral husbandry for the land-based coral nursery in the Florida Keys. Uh, I'm really excited to have her joining us again for this birdie hour to share what she's been up to and to share about her work. So thanks so much, Alicia, for joining us. Um, thanks for having me as a guest speaker. I'm really excited to be talking about coral restoration on the Florida Reef Track. Um, as Max said, I'm working as a coral restoration technician at Moat Marine Lab Satellite Campus in the Florida Keys. So just to go over what we're gonna go over in the presentation, I'm gonna talk about what corals are and the importance of coral reefs. Then we're gonna talk about the Florida Reef Tract. I'm gonna explain what it is and the threats that it faces. I'm also going to talk about restoration science. We'll talk about some of the nurseries that we have, the ways that we propagate new corals and how we outplant them. So to start off, what are corals? Corals, while they might look like plants or they might look like rocks, are actually animals. And they're pretty closely related to jellyfish and sea anemones um, because they have these stinging cells. So this is a nematocyst, this is a stinging cell, and that's why they're similar to jellies and anemones. They all have these stinging cells. Um, each coral is made up of an individual polyp that's seen in this picture here. So as you can see, it's got a mouth, and the stinging cells, and then it also has a calcium carbonate skeleton. So this is the skeleton that connects all of the polyps together and creates a coral colony. So you can see in picture two, really good example of this, the green on the inside are the uh, coral polyps and you can see the brown tissue around them and there's a bunch of them together. So this would be a colony. Um, this picture here is an example of a boulder coral. They are more lumpy than other corals and provide structure for the reef versus picture one here are branching corals. Um, these guys also provide structure and a lot of places for animals to hide out on the reef. So why are coral reefs important? Coral reefs are among the most biologically diverse and economically important ecosystems on earth. Corals themselves are ecosystem engineers and coral reefs create specialized habitats that provide shelter, food, and breeding sites for numerous plants and animals. Um, coral reefs, reefs lay the foundation of a dynamic ecosystem with tremendous biodiversity. According to the Smithsonian, 25% of all ocean life depends on coral reefs, even though they only make up 2% of the seafloor. That's an incredible number. Um, they are very similar to what rainforests are on land for us. In addition to supporting diverse life, coral reefs are important for the survival of human communities. Structurally, corals create a, a barrier between open ocean and islands. This dissipates wave energy and diminishes the impacts of storms. Um, additionally, nearly 1 billion people rely on coral reefs to feed their communities. So this is the Florida Reef Track. Um, to give you some perspective about where it is, this is Miami area, this is the Everglades, these are the Florida Keys, and this light blue strip that you see here, this is the Florida Reef Track. So behind Australia's Great Barrier Reef and the Mesoamerican Reef, which spans Mexico, Guatemala, Belize, and Honduras, this is the third largest barrier reef on Earth. Um, it stretches nearly 200 miles and is nearly four miles wide, which is huge. 
Um, the Florida Reef Track creates this nice arc along the Florida Keys, and this protects the Keys from storm surges, and it's a natural buffer for wave action. This is incredibly important because we get hit by hurricanes pretty often, so we need this protection. So corals create specialized habitats, as I said before. They provide shelter, food, and breeding sites for commercially important fisheries, such as groupers, snappers, and spiny lobsters here in Florida. The Florida Reef Track also um, supports the economy in this area. Five million people visit the Florida Keys each year, and a lot of them enjoy the ocean recreation and our reefs. This contributes $2.4 billion in sales annually to the area. Here, more than one in every two jobs are related to our marine ecosystem. So the Florida Reef Track is immensely important, but there are also huge threats that face it. So in the last 40 years, healthy coral cover has declined by 90% in the Florida Keys. You can see that in this picture here. So this is Cray Forest Reef. Um, this is just one example of a reef that has gone through a collapse. So basically, in 1975, this picture here, you can see that the reef had a lot of dimension to it. It had lots of places for fish to hide, a lot of places for other animals to be in, and it was pretty healthy structure-wise. When you look at the picture in 2014, you don't see that same structure. Basically, that's because the coral that were supporting the ecosystem became unhealthy and it went through a collapse. So basically, all the layers fell down onto each other and it created this rubble field. So this is, like I said, just one reef. We have a lot here in the Florida Keys and a lot of them look like this at this point. So this decline can be, cannot be blamed on a single cause. It's more of like an interconnected web of things that are causing this. Um, there's no anchors and groundings that crush healthy coral. There's also pollution that make it difficult for the coral to survive, as well as overfishing that damages the populations of fish that are necessary for keeping the coral reef healthy. And then we also get storms like Hurricane Irma that hit in 2017. These storms rip coral from the bottom and whatever remains gets covered in sediment. Not only that, but in recent years, there's been afflictions like the stony coral tissue loss disease that have killed off huge percentages of once healthy coral. And if that weren't enough, coral reefs are facing climate issues that come with climate change. This includes coral bleaching, which can weaken and kill corals. So without our help, the corals will no longer be able to provide the structure, habitat, and beauty that the Florida Keys are known for. Uh, the ecosystem will change, and indeed it's already changing, as you can see by these pictures. Um, it's turning into an algal-dominated habitat instead of a habitat that has lots of structure and lots of places for plants and animals. In addition to no longer providing this structure, that's also not providing protection for people here on land. Like I said, they're really important for hurricanes and protecting us against huge storm surges. So not only that, but losing coral reefs could result in cascading effects to the Florida Keys economy and culture, which are firmly rooted in our marine ecosystem. So that makes coral restoration really important, and that's why we are called to act. In response to the decline in coral health, the Florida Keys region has become a world leader in coral restoration. Coral restoration has two main goals. The first is to reskin the reef. And when I say that, basically what I mean is to put as much coral tissue out onto the reef as possible. The second goal that we have is for the coral that we do put out onto the reef to become sexually reproductive, thus increasing genetic diversity on the reef and subsequently also increasing the ecosystem's resilience. And I'm going to use that word a lot in here, resilience. So basically that just means the ecosystem's ability to bounce back from any stressors that it might encounter. At Moat, we pride ourselves on using multiple types of propagation within our programs to maximize the coral that are available for outplanting, ensuring that there's genetic diversity out on the reef, and so that we are able to undertake extensive research on corals to detect anything that might help their resiliency. So um, in this picture here, this is a couple ways that we might get coral that we would then grow in our nurseries. 
So if you look here, this would be considered a coral of opportunity. We get coral of opportunity from the wild if they are broken off and under 30 centimeters. So basically a smaller piece of coral that's just not attached to anything, that's something that we can collect. We also get our coral of opportunity from construction projects. So if there is, for example, a harbor being put in or like a bridge being fixed, we can get coral from those projects as well. So once we have our larger chunk coral opportunity, we take it and cut it into smaller pieces in a process that I'll explain a little bit later. Um, once we have them in these smaller pieces, we allow them to grow out. And once they reach about the size of a silver dollar is when we will put them out onto the field. And then we will see if they fuse together. Once they become about the size of a basketball, they're able to reproduce. And then they can produce their gametes. So we want them to be reproductive, like I said, so we can increase genetic diversity. But there's other ways that we can do that, like collecting the gametes from the wild, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So we can collect them, have them crossbreed in the lab, and then also grow them out until they're about the size of a silver dollar. And then we'll outplant them out onto our reef. So next I'm gonna talk about our nurseries. So we have two coral nurseries out in the field. So these are marine-based ones. These ones are used primarily to grow staghorn, which is a type of branching coral. However, they're also used for some boulder corals. Um, so when we're out in the field and we're growing them, basically we'll cut them into something called nibbins. That's about from my index finger to my thumb finger, so about five inches. Um, we'll attach to them to these PVC, ooh, PVC pipe trees right here with fishing line and then have them grow in our nursery for six to nine months before we outplant them. When we outplant them, we use nails to attach them to the substrate. They'll eventually grow over the nails and then grow towards each other and eventually fuse together. I have some pictures of that a little bit later in the slides. So we also have a land-based coral nursery. This is where I work most of the time. As you can see, we keep the coral in tank at this stage of the nursery. So in these tanks, we have air so that we can create ideal pHs for them to grow. We also have a flow through system. So water from either our well or the canal comes in through the system and flows out through this drain. We also have shades in order to control the temperature within the raceway and keep it within the range so that corals will grow faster. These are our shades right here. And we also use the shades to protect them from rain. So for our land-based nursery, we grow mostly boulders and branching corals, um, both of which provide structure for the reef. These species tend to grow a little bit slower than the staghorn that we have growing in the field. It can take them anywhere from six to 13 months to reach about the size of a silver dollar, at which point we would outplant them. So the following species are ones that we have on site. So we have mountainous star coral. These ones are really beautiful. Um, this is a picture of the same species, even though it has different shapes. Out in the wild, it will grow either like this boulder shape, or it will sheet out like this, depending on where it's at in the reef. These guys are endangered, so we're really happy to be able to have them on site and to be able to outplant them in order to help this population. We also have giant star coral, so this one's closely related to the previous one, although it gets a lot larger. Um, their colonies can get up to five feet in diameter, which is huge and incredible, and their polyps are about the size of my thumb. We also have our Pseudodiploria species. These are our brain corals. This first one here is the knobby brain coral. It grows better in shallow water versus the symmetrical brain coral, which we have found grows better in deeper water. And then lastly, we have elk horn on site. This is closely related to the stag horn that we grow in the field, but these guys do a lot better on land, which is why we grow them here versus out in the field nurseries. So this is microfragmentation. Um, I made a video a couple months back about it, so I'm just gonna go ahead and play the video. It'll explain what microfragmentation is and why it's important to the work that we do.
sweet. So basically microfragmentation is what we use here on land. Um, it's like we're taking the coral and cutting it into smaller pieces. And it's very similar to when you cut your skin and your skin grows back faster. Basically, when we cut the coral, we're asking the tissue to grow back faster. Um, this accelerates the growth by about 40%, meaning that we're able to speed up coral growth in general, um, which is great. And it's super important because, like I said, the one goal that we have, the first one that we have, is to reskin the reef. So we need as much tissue as possible. And then once we have it out on the reef, what we need is for it to grow fast so that it fuses together and so that it's able to reproduce. Um, which by accelerating the growth by making these cuts, we are allowing them to grow faster. So basically this is talking about um, opening up the tissue along the edges. So basically when we start, we abrade the edges. Um, this, like I said, creates a cut and then the tissue can grow back faster. So in between each cut, I put it in salt water. And then, so next we cut it into sections. So basically on a piece like this, I would cut it into nine different pieces. Um, the goal is to have it be about the size of a single Lego. Um, from those strips, that's when I cut them into about the size of a single Lego, as it says there. Um, this is a diamond edge bandsaw, so you can see my hands getting really close to that blade. Um, it won't cut me, but it does cut through our coral. So after each step, like I said, it gets a saltwater rinse. I hit it with that little pipette, and that blasts off any sediment that might have built up and makes sure that it doesn't end up in the cuts. So this part is where we shave down the fragment so that it sticks better onto its new substrate and so that it doesn't have as much um, space that it has to grow over before it can be outplanted. So once it's about the size of a single Lego and has been um, shaved on the bottom, we glue it with marine super glue and we put it on the plug. So that's the new substrate that it's gonna grow onto. And you can see it's about the size of a silver dollar. Once it's filled that entire plug, we know it's time to outplant it. So basically this part of the video is just explaining why it's important to accelerate the growth. Like I said, um, it increases the speed at which it will grow to a reproductive size once we outplant it. So then, So that's microfragmentation, and that's a way to get our coral to um, propagate asexually, but then we also have sexual reproduction. So this is when the corals are spawning. We go into the field and gather their gametes. Um, coral are broadcast spawners. Um, most of the time it's triggered by chemicals in the water and um, the moon cycle, but it depends on the species how often they would broadcast spawn. Most only broadcast spawn once a year in the summer, so it's important to get the timing right. Um, basically that means that we go on night dives and that we collect the gametes once they're out in the water column. Once we've collected them, we bring them back to the lab and we're able to crossbreed them. Um, basically creating new genetic mixes that otherwise wouldn't be in the wild because there's reproductive barriers to create these mixes. Um, reproductive barriers include the fact that the colonies might be a little bit too far from each other for the gametes in the water column to meet and to fertilize. Um, another barrier is that the chemical signals that are in the water have been thrown off by something and the corals spawn at different times. Um, by gathering the gametes ourselves, we are eliminating these barriers and we're able to, to create new genetic mixes. Um, and then eventually we're able to test those genetic mixes to see if they're more resilient. If they are more resilient, then we'll outplant them and see how they do in the wild. So, once we have our corals settled down onto our plugs, once again, that was the ceramic um, disc with the stem on it. Um, we do a lot of coral husbandry in order to keep them in the best conditions possible for coral growth. That being said, sometimes we come across some pests 
um, we can tell that we have pests when a healthy coral, like this one here, goes from this nice rich brown coloration to this to this green and gray coloration, this means that we probably have a problem in our raceway. When we have problems, most of the time the culprits are either these hydroids these, or these aptasias. These guys create stings on our coral. These stings turn into abrasions and then we get these little microbes called ciliates that live in them. This is really hard to see, but this is what it looks like when ciliates have affected the coral. You get some of that paling color. So when we have issues like this, we take marine superglue and we glue over the hydroids and the aptasia. For the ciliates, we put the coral in an iodine solution. This paralyzes the ciliates and then we blast them off of our coral with a turkey baster. Um, growing them outside, we also come across some algae problems. So that happens when it's really hot out and we have algal blooms or if a little bit of rainwater gets in our raceways. Um, once again, we have lids that prevent this quite often, but when we do have problems, what we do is we take a brush or a scraper and we go ahead and get that algae off of there. These are a couple different types that we come across. Um, and then these are our cool critters that live in our tanks and help us with these pests. So in this picture, we have an emerald crab. These guys eat our hydroids. And in this picture, we have a snail called an astria. And these snails help us with our algae mitigation. Basically, they go around and eat in our tanks, even when we're not at work, which is great. Full-time help. So this is a picture of outplanting. Like I said, once the coral gets to the correct size, we want to put them out on the reef. These are pictures taken from the corals grown in our field nursery and then outplanted. So once again, these are staghorn. They are attached to the substrate with a nail and a zip tie. Eventually the coral grows over the nails and the zip ties and then fuse together with each other. So this first picture here, you can see five different ones. They were outplanted on that day that the picture was taken. So day one, picture two was taken after seven months. So you can see a lot of growth has happened and they're providing structure out on the reef. This is what outplanting looks like when we take them from our land-based nursery and we have grown them on plugs. So you can see the plugs here. So basically the team will scuba dive down and find a good looking um, dead coral head. So basically we're looking for a spot that coral once grew but doesn't anymore in order to reskin that area. So once we find the correct substrate, we drill holes into it and then put our corals into those holes. You can see this in picture two. We secure the corals with marine epoxy. This allows them to stay in one spot and then it'll sheet out over those. So picture three here is an example of what happens over time. The corals you can see are sheeting out and then they eventually meet up with each other. Each array that we put out has either five to 20 plugs in them and we make sure that they're the same genotype so then when they sheet out and they touch each other they recognize each other as coming from the same genetic background and they fuse together. That's really important because like I said when they get to be about the size of a basketball is when they're able to reproduce so as they fuse together they get larger even faster and we really want them to reproduce in order to put that genetic diversity out onto the reef and increase the resilience. So Moat's had a lot of success with this. Um, even though we're facing huge challenges, um, that are the issues that the Florida Reef Tract face. Um, a lot of Moat's successes have to do with the fact that we are able to grow so many corals. We have 40,000 plus right now growing in our field-based and land-based nurseries. To date, Moat staff have outplanted over 80,000 corals with 28,000 500 corals outplanted in 2019 alone. Routinely, we have a 95% survival rate after one month, and we have an 80 to 90% survival rate after one year. This is incredible, and we are looking forward to ramping up our numbers and continuing our research to figure out the best ways to do coral restoration in order to get the Florida Reef Track back to the healthy state that it once was. 
So I wanted to give a huge thank you to San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory for inviting me to be a guest speaker, as well as for Mid Penn Regional Open Space for sponsoring this talk. And then I'd also like to thank some of my coworkers, um, Jessica Garlock, Sarah Hamlin, and Zach Craig for helping me put this presentation together. Um, and any images that you see in here that don't have a specific caption on them telling you where they're from are courtesy of Mo. And then I have one bonus slide. I was a water bird intern and I love my water birds. And even though I'm not working with birds anymore, I still bird a lot. So this is the great white heron. This is found in the Florida Keys and it's pretty different because as you can see, it's a white bird, but normally I would think it would have dark legs and think it was an egret but it is actually either a color morph or a subspecies of a great blue heron. There's some argument over which one it is. Um, but as you can see here, the great white heron tends to have their breeding sites in the Florida Keys, and we have a national wildlife refuge here in order to protect them. So I'm gonna open it up to any questions that we might have. All right, so Steve asked, can you grow coral in aquariums at home? Yeah, so you can. There's actually a um, pretty good community and we learn a lot from them as well. They have like a lot of blog posts, um, but you can grow them in aquariums at home. I would highly suggest Googling it and seeing if that's something that you're interested in doing because there are a lot of options out there. Um, those corals are mostly Pacific corals, so we do get some information from people who are growing them at home, but we are working with different species most of the time. Laura asked, are there any species of concern that are not able to be grown by people? So there are, and then research is being done to figure out the best way to do that. Um, like I said, it's a pretty new field, really hasn't been around for much longer than like the 70s because there hasn't been a need for it up until then. Um, so everybody's doing their part to try to figure out how to grow coral the best way. Um, and there's a lot of different things that moat doesn't do, but the microfragmentation and the sexual reproduction are the ways that we've found grows coral the best. Judy asked, at what temperature does the water need to be in order to propagate? So it depends on the species, actually. So each species has different cues for them, um, depending, like I said, water temperature, um, cycle, moon, and then also chemicals in the water. So it really is species dependent. Laura asked, what is marine superglue consist of? And Jeff responded that marine superglue is just cyanoacrylate gel. Is there anything you want to add? It's basically like normal superglue, but it dries when you put it in the water instead of when you leave it in the air. How Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> um, and then Jeff asked, do you ever use, and I'm probably going to mispronounce this, um, Lysmata wordumani to deal with aptasia? So we use the marine superglue that we use with the coral. Um, I'm not really sure honestly what that is, but <laughs> we use the marine superglue, Jeff, because we know it's safe with our coral anyways, so that's what we tend to stick with. Okay. I think it might be, um, he might be referring to a uh, some kind of biological control maybe for okay so if it's a biological control we try to avoid that in our raceways as much as possible um we have a flow through system so basically water goes in whatever is in the tank with the coral ends up going out and it gets filtered but we try to keep bio agents out of it because it's peppermint shrimp oh we haven't used them that i know of but that would be awesome if we could. There are some herbivory studies that we've had where we've tried to get different animals in the tanks to figure it out. That's how we got the emerald crabs to eat the hydroids. That was one of the studies. Um, we've also had different species of fish as well in the past. Cool. Um, Linda asked, what prevents your new coral reef from succumbing to the same problem that killed the original reef? So that's why we research resiliency. So we have an entire side system here that's meant for research. 
Um, it's called a chaos system. Basically, we go through and we will mimic what we believe temperatures and pH will be in the future to try to figure out which corals we have are actually going to be the most resilient. Um, based off of the research we find, that's what we end up producing more. So um, a lot of the research that we do here reforms our uh, informs our restoration practices, and our restoration practices, like the results we're seeing in the field, informs the questions that we then research. Karen asked, are there many colorful corals native to Florida reefs? So yes and no. We have a lot of really colorful soft corals, but we don't have as bright of corals as you would see in the Pacific. Jan asked, are there areas of, on the reef that appear to have pristine undisturbed corals? And are there specific environmental conditions that support pristine coral conditions? So it depends on the reef if it's pristine or not. The most pristine reefs that we have are the furthest away from people. So um, we used to have uh, septic systems in on most of the islands and so the septic systems would, when the storm surges came up, would sometimes flood and then that created problems to areas that were near people. Um, luckily we've switched to sewers for the most part, which is nice. Um, and then it's keeping our water quality a lot better. But um, Janet has to do with water quality most of the time. Also depends, like I said, on the location, but the further away from the islands that people are on, probably the better the reefs will be. Um, Jacqueline asked, does the oxybenzone sunscreen contributing or is is that contributing to coral death and if so are there any plans to ban it in Florida? Yeah so the Florida Keys actually have it banned. I'm pretty sure Key West definitely does and I think a lot of the other Keys here have it banned. Um, that's a big initiative that some of the research that was done both by Moat Marine Lab and other marine labs in Florida um, really got put into policy, which is awesome. So like I said, research informs policy. We did research on that. We found that it's not good and there have been bans put in place. Michael asked, when you talk about reproduction, are you producing some kinds of hybrid corals or are you mixing isolated groups from the same species? So basically, yes and no. There have been hybrids with different corals, um, not different species, but from different locations around the Caribbean. Those corals we haven't put out on the reef yet because of there's some questions of whether we should be creating these hybrids or not. Um, when we outplant them, we're making sure that the corals that we've crossbred are coming from A, the same species, but also some of the same areas in the Florida reef track. Derek asked, are sponges corals or are they their own species? So they're their own species and sponges are really cool. Um, they filter the water and they're a really important part of the reef habitat. So they keep water quality as it should be and like I said filter out pollutants and stuff like that but they are their own species. Um, their whole own family actually in the genetics tree. Jeff asked, do you take corals infected with the new tissue loss disease and frag off the damaged areas to recover healthy tissue for propagation? And if so, so ooh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, if so, what do you use as a dip treatment? So we don't bring any corals that might have coral disease onto our site just because we don't want that to be a problem. Um, we have quarantine tanks for when we do take coral of opportunity from the wild, they stay in those tanks. Those tanks are not connected to any other part of our system. Um, as far as treatments for the stony coral tissue loss disease, what they found is if you take a sick coral and let's say half of it's healthy, half of it's sick, if you create a fire zone with a drill, basically just cutting into the tissue and then into the skeleton as well, you can create kind of like a moat between them. And then if you put um, antibacterial substances in it, it should prevent the spread of the disease and that's what we've been doing out in the wild. Um, there, other parts of moat are doing a lot of the tissue loss um, research right now 
up in Sarasota, they're doing a lot with it. And they have, like I said, they're on a whole separate system. What they've found is that they think it's bacterial and they think it's waterborne. Um, but most of our coral that we grow here on site aren't susceptible to it unless like you actually put the two coral together. So they're still figuring out the mechanics of how it's spreading. Um, Margie asked, what are some of the challenges of field work? So there are quite a few challenges. Probably first and foremost is the fact that it's a marine environment. Um, so you have to have your dive gears has to be good. It's like a couple extra costs in, involved in going and doing the field work. You have to have a boat. You have to have your dive gear, etc. Um, and then you have to have really good conditions to be able to dive. Um, if the viz is bad, you're not going to be able to do the field work that you need to do. If it's surgy at all, you're going to have problems. If there's a high current, you're going to have problems as well. So it really does add a lot of barriers um, to doing the field work. That being said, I think it's incredible to be able to dive for my field work. Um, so it definitely is a trade-off for sure. Vivian asked, do you control the microbiome in your tanks to help with growth? So sometimes we do. A lot of microbiome research is still being done um, up, up at a different part in Sarasota. They're doing a lot of the microbiome research. That's like the same department that does the disease studies. So um, they're doing a lot of that, like I said, up in Sarasota. So basically I'm at a satellite campus in the Florida Keys. Our job is just like growth right now. Um, I'd love to do more research on the microbiome and seeing how we can make it even more ideal conditions through manipulating that. Lawrence asked, um, is acidification a problem in Florida? Yes, it definitely is. So um, that's a problem. We're seeing it more and more. Um, like I said, we have a whole separate system that we're able to test different future um, acidification levels in our water so we can see which corals are more resilient to um, the stressor that acidification would cause. That being said, um, it really just depends on our coral and what ocean conditions are like. Like I said, it's a prediction. So the more research that we do on it, the more clear answers we'll have. And like I said, the research informs what we outplant in restoration. So the more information we have on that, the better we can um, kind of shift our deliverables. So like, let's say we find a genotype that's really resistant to acidification, doesn't really care what the pH is, it still grows no matter what. That's something that we would probably ramp up production on and then outplant more. Um, going back to sponges, Jan asked if sponges have been less affected by the issues that have impacted corals. So I'm actually not really sure. Um, I, I would assume that they would be less impacted. They're hardier, but they might have issues with um, storms. That being said, sponges are able to um, reproduce asexually. So if they break apart, they'll still survive. And then that's just how they spread. So it really depends. And I'm not an expert on sponges, so I'm not really sure. Linda asked, is snorkeling and diving allowed on the reef? Yeah, so snorkeling and diving are definitely allowed on the reef. And I personally think it's really good to get people out on the reef and interacting with the ecosystem so that they can see firsthand what a reef is like. Um, I think it really sparks people's passion for it. Like that's how I got involved. I grew up snorkeling at Lou Key. Um, which is why I chose to move down here and do this. Um, so I think it's really important. That being said, having like safe dive and snorkel practices, like making sure your fins don't hit the coral and stuff like that is really important. Also making sure that you wear um, coral safe sunscreen is also important when you're in the water. Um, Derek asked, do you use seawater on land? So maybe in your tanks? Yeah, so our raceways are filled with either the canal water, so we get our canal water pumped from the mouth of the canal, or we have wells, and those are also seawater, so basically the way our islands are set up is if you drill far enough, you hit 
salt water underneath the island. So like in the Bay Area, you guys have aquifers. We, we just have salt water down there. So our well is able to pump up that. And we put it through a lot of filtration systems in order to clean it really well before we put it in our tanks. Maureen asked, what do you feed the corals in your tanks? So most of the time we don't actually need to feed them. Um, they have these little algal symbiotes that live with them that use um, photosynthesis to produce energy. So the coral can get like up to 95% of its energy from those little guys, which is great. Um, other than that, we also, like I said, pump seawater through so they're able to get any other types of nutrients that they would need from the seawater. If we have some that aren't doing so well, we will feed them and we'll feed them ground up shrimp like the same kind of powder that you would feed fish. But uh, Michael asked, what is considered the top current stressor on Florida reefs? So there's a lot of different ones. Um, probably top two would be water quality and climate change. So climate change is definitely something that is regional and global. So that's a little bit harder to tackle, but it's something that is worth doing, like switching to renewable energies and using less things that emit CO2 in general. Really good. Water quality, however, is something that we can work on at like a local level among all of the keys. And that's something that I think is really tackleable. And so that's a major thing that's affecting corals. And like I said, there's been major steps in order to improve it, like putting the, the, the septic system on sewer instead. That's like one example of how we've improved water quality. So both Derek and Siska asked, does tourism affect the reefs? Yes, so tourism, like I said, is a huge industry down here. Um, it brings in $2.4 billion to the Keys per year. Like that's a lot of money and we have 5 million visitors per year. Um, so tourists definitely do affect the reefs. However, they are really only taken by dive shops and dive boats to certain parts of the reef. So there's a lot of areas that tourists don't get to see. So it kind of just depends on the area, but like the more people in the area, the more changes you're going to see anyways. It's not necessarily tourists doing it. It's just people being around. Um, let's see. And now Lynn asked, did COVID bring, uh, did the COVID pause bring about any positive visual changes? Yeah, so um, I haven't been out on the water that much because we limited who, who's allowed out on the boats, but from what I've heard, there's a lot clearer water quality just because there's less people out. Um, which is a good improvement, definitely. So that is one improvement that has been seen. Business has increased by a lot. And now um, Lynn also asked, have oil spills affected the reefs? So yes, actually, it was last 2005, I think. What was, it? was it the BP oil spill? I, I was very young when that happened, but I like remember it being a problem when I came and visited the Keys when I was a kid. Um, we did see some damage. It didn't hit this area as badly as it hit the, the rest of the Gulf, um, but it did hit us. So that is something that if there were another big oil spill will potentially affect the reefs in very negative ways. Um, let's see, Derek asked, what seabirds live on the reefs? Okay, so we have like a lot of different seabirds down here. Um, we have a lot of terns, which is very cool. We have a few different species of those. Um, they don't necessarily live on the reef, but they do utilize the reef in order to feed. We also have magnific well, magnificent frigate birds, a little hard to say, but very majestic. There are some of my favorite birds down here, and those ones are pelagic, so basically they never... Their, their wings never touch the water, they just fly everywhere. If their wings do touch the water, then they're unable to fly and they would probably kaput in the water. Um, but they only go on land when they need to nest, otherwise they're always flying around. And they do utilize our reefs. Um, they also utilize the deep sea and a lot of different other ecosystems, but that's something that we see out on the reefs. Uh, Chris asked, are you hopeful or pessimistic that the reefs will survive? Um, I think you have to be hopeful to have my job because uh, 
it, there's a lot of things that are problems that the reefs are facing, but I think that if we work together as like a collective community, we're going to be able to overcome those things. Um, I think that if we are able to mitigate the human impacts that we're having on the coral reefs, that they'll be able to revitalize themselves over time. But I do think people need to be involved in doing coral restoration in order to put more coral out on the reef so that when we mitigate these other problems as well, there's still tissue out there that's gonna be able to grow and reproduce. Um, Christina asked, are there any non-native species of coral that negatively affect the ecosystem? Yeah, so there are some non-native species. There's also some that are native that aren't supposed to be growing as well as they are. Um, it kind of just depends um, a lot. So with, a lot of the species in decline, it's left open niches for other species to move in. So we are seeing some that are invasive, but more we're seeing ones that just weren't as important to the reef before taking over more than like invasive species coming in. Let's see, Prakash asked, um, how do you compare the problems in Florida to those in other parts of the world in terms of the reefs? Okay, so you always hear about the Great Barrier Reef going through bleaching events and stuff like that, and that is a major issue. The Great Barrier Reef is not going through as much um, reef collapses as we're seeing in the Florida Keys. So like I said, there's a 90% decline in coral cover, and like the picture I showed, um, that creates a collapse. So basically the structure that holds up the reef is unable to, and then there goes the whole ecosystem when it collapses in on itself. So we're facing those issues while other parts of the world are facing other issues. Like I said, the major thing in the Pacific right now, both on the Great Barrier Reef, you're seeing lots of um, news about bleaching, but also in Hawaii, they're having problems as well. And around a lot of the Pacific Islands, bleaching is a major issue. In Florida, it's more, there's a lot of different things contributing to it. And I'm not saying that there's not a lot of different things contributing to the um, problems that they're seeing in the Pacific, but definitely in the Florida Keys, um, we have a lot of issues, like I said, that we can tackle at a local level and that we need to be tackling at a local level. Globally, like I said, climate change is a major issue. So switching to renewable energy would be really good. Um, and then as far as, ecosystems in the Caribbean goes, it depends on what country and what type of, honestly, what type of regulations they have on on the reefs themselves and like the reef fish. So like I know the Turks and Caicos have pretty healthy reefs comparatively. Um, the Mesoamerican reef is doing pretty good. Um, it just kind of depends. Lynn asked, what are the effects of water temperature changes on the reefs? So if there's a cold snap, it can stop growth and kill corals. So we see cold temperatures once or twice a year. It'll get into the, not like air temperature into the 40s. Water temperature will get cold like into the 50s, but that's just like a cold snap. Like I said, that can kill coral. It's more the hot temperatures that are the problem. Um, I was talking about those algal symbiotes. Those are called zoothanthali and they kind of freak out when it gets too hot. Basically, they stop photosynthesizing and then start taking the coral's energy. So they're supposed to be giving the coral energy and the coral's like, well, you've become basically just a bad tenant right now. I'm not getting anything from you. So they expel those algal symbiotes when it's really hot. And then that leads to the bleaching that we see. So. The bleaching, like I said, occurs when they push those algal symbiotes out. Those symbiotes can come back if the water temperatures go down. So it doesn't kill the coral immediately. It's just like a period where the coral is just existing and not thriving. Um, if those water temperatures stay too high for too long, the coral will eventually die. But like I said, it is able to recover if the temperatures come down fast enough. Derek wants to know, what are some of the fish that live on the reef? There's lots of fish on the reef. I, I, okay, so like I said, some commercially important species are groupers and snappers, but there's a lot of other fish out on the reef. You have, um, I'm trying to think of like more known fish. Um, 
you have like tangs out on the reef. You also have um, wrasses out on the reef. So those are ones that live in the coral and around the coral. Um, those are the kind of colorful fish that you think of. There's also uh, barracuda will come to the reef in order to eat. Um, all of the smaller fish. There's butterfly fish and angel fish, which are from the same family, and they are everywhere on our reefs. We also have a lot of parrot fish as well. And I'm just broadly categorizing. Um, there's each each one of those I named has multiple different species here as well. So um, if you're in the area, it's definitely worth picking up like a book for when you go out there so that you can identify the fish that you see. I do that all the time. I love it. <laughs> I imagine that must be gorgeous to see. Um, Suska asked, compared to other reefs in the world, how does the Florida reef compared um, or are the reefs damaged equally? So I would argue that our reefs are pretty bad off compared to a lot of different reefs. Like I said, it kind of just depends on the area, but in the Pacific, I think their reefs are doing a lot better than ours because they're not necessarily going through that ecosystem collapse like we're seeing. Um, Jeff asked, how do I transition from aquaculturing for the aquarium hobby to research propagation? Ooh. So, Jeff, let me get your contact info because I can put you in contact with people who would have that answer. I don't off the top of my head, um, it would involve switching species and stuff like that. So like I said, let me get your contact information and I'll put you in contact with the people who do that sort of thing. The last question we have on here, for now anyway, is from Lynn. She asks, what are some federal policy changes that threaten the area? Oh, <laughs> that is, it kind of depends on what area you mean and how broad of a scale you're talking about because like switching to more fossil fuels or like promoting that industry in any way that hurts our reefs and that could be anywhere from putting a pipeline in from Alaska all the way down to Texas and that's nowhere near Florida but that's something that federally would affect us. Um, like I said climate change is a global issue so it's also going to be a national issue. Um, as far as anything that is in the works right now, I don't know of anything that would specifically hurt the reefs. A couple more questions have come in. This is great. <laughs> um, Derek asked, um, let's see, are there any unnatural things on the reef? And maybe you can clarify that too, Derek, if you want to expand, but so I'm, I'm going to interpret that as like species that aren't supposed to be found here. Um, we went over coral a little bit, but there's definitely lionfish out on our reefs. Um, that's, a, that's a Pacific species, and they think that it was introduced when we had a hurricane that came through and like flooded a few different buildings that had lionfish in them. And lionfish are everywhere in the Caribbean at this point in time. Um, they are really, really crazy predators. Basically, whatever fits in their mouth, they'll eat, which means that they're eating a lot of fish at an early stage in their life so that they aren't able to grow up and they aren't able to reproduce. So it's affecting a lot of different fish populations. Um, and like I said, they're everywhere on the reef. They also have those spines that make it really hard for other fish to eat them. So like the predators that would be eating other fish like reapers and barracudas and sharks aren't going after lionfish, which is why they're able to reproduce so much. So lionfish are a major issue here. Jacqueline, um, going back to policy, asked, how are local governments helping or hurting the conservation efforts? Yeah, so I think local governments in the Florida Keys are pretty on board with helping conservation efforts in whatever way possible. Like I said, it's a huge part of the culture and the economy down here. Um, and the government wants to promote both of those things. So they've been pretty supportive for the most part, um, putting in like regulations. Um, there's some controversy with locals over whether there should be more marine sanctuaries or less. Basically a marine sanctuary limits um, like take and stuff like that, depending on what type of sanctuary it is. Um, 
that's something that is a little bit controversial but like i said the um local governments have been pretty supportive so like as far as ocean plastics go they've been banning straws um i'm looking forward to a plastic bag ban maybe but that hasn't happened yet um and then as far as like being supportive like with chemicals that go in the water um a big initiative was doing the sewage system like i said so that was really run by the government and then also um banning sunscreens that are not reef friendly that was another big thing that the local government's done so they are really supportive for the most part and it's great that they are we need the support of local government and it's great that people are so attuned to the marine environment around here because it makes talking about it a lot easier because people are passionate about it and willing to protect it lynn asked historically did native people utilize the area yeah so we had um oh seminoles down here they're they're the tribe that was down here the most so they there's like artifacts from them on big pine which is about mid keys um all the way down to key west as well so there were tribes people down here i don't know a lot of that history honestly because i didn't grow up here so i didn't get a lot of it but i know there were people down here and they were utilizing the area um i think they were utilizing because we have key deer down here um they're like really tiny deer but they are a source of protein so i'm pretty sure they utilize their population as well as we have alligators that population was utilized sharks were utilized as well so that's something that i do know off the top of my head and Siska asked, at what temperature does it get dangerous for corals? So it's over 31 degrees Celsius. I don't know off the top of my head what that is in Fahrenheit, but that's when our corals start to get stressed out. So um, thank you, everybody, for attending. And thank you, Alicia, for this fantastic talk. Is yeah, there, thank you. <laughs> um, do you want to add any last remarks? Um, just thank you for the opportunity to give this presentation. If other people have questions, you can get them to me as well. Just let me know. You have my email and contact information. I'd love to answer more questions.